It's Wednesday morning. You know what that means. It's time for another episode of the Alabama Slam Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Hanna. What's going on, guys? It's Patrick Akers. And I also like to ask people awkwardly to let me hold their thing. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, let, let's let's not waste any time. We've got a whole lot of stuff to cover. Uh, mostly two nights worth of WrestleMania. Uh, one night was better than the other, and we'll get into that. But uh, and then we'll do. We've got a couple things from Raw to talk about, and a couple of AEW things uh, here and there. Uh, and even some additional WWE and NXT stuff um, once we get through Mania and Raw. So uh, let's jump into it. Um, well, I want to save overall thoughts for night one until we're done with all of these matches. Um, so we'll just jump right into it with Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley. Uh, Rhea Ripley retains, you know, a decent match out of the gate. Wasn't what I expected or hoped it would be, but um, if the if what they're telling us is true and Becky Lynch was sick all week, um, I mean, it was still a good match for what it was, but it didn't live up to the hype. Um, now, I had a problem with a couple of matches this weekend that I don't think lived up to the hype. Um, and there was probably a good reason for this one. So what what would what, you guys think about it? I thought it picked up in the end. But yeah, like you said, uh, the sickness probably had a lot to do with it. Uh, 102 fever is no joke. <laughs> right. Especially with all the things that come with it. Probably, you know, nausea and everything like that so i mean you mm-hmm. cannot feel like yourself uh but and i thought it started out slow but i think it i think it got better at the end the bigger this is not really a problem uh i mean the crowds now are 100 percent behind rhea ripley and i don't think it matters who you throw up against her right she's that big of a star and again that's not really a problem it's just a and I guess we got our answer on Monday Night Raw. It's going to depend on who you throw up against her. Because I think the crowds going forward are going to be at least 80-20 in her favor. If not 90-10. If not 95-5. If not in a smarky place where it's 100% Rhea Ripley. So uh, that's a good problem to have if you're WWE. And she looks like a star. And this felt like a little bit of a send-off for Becky Lynch. I think both Becky and Seth are going to kind of take some time away. Neither one of them were on Monday Night Raw. This felt like a, with her reading the book and the excerpts, like, this is everything I've done. I'm at peace with everything I've done now. Let's take a break for a second and kind of reassess where we are going forward. Yeah. From, from, from what I saw, they're going to be gone for about four months. And they're, I'm, not, I'm sorry, four weeks. Four weeks, about a month or so. They'll They'll disappear. Yeah, and she's been busting her ass leading up to Mania with pushing the book, which only helps push the company even further. So I'm sure they're cool with her taking some time away. I enjoyed this one a little bit more than I think y'all did. I, I didn't. I thought it was a slow pace. I got you got to see a lot of like you know, it was Rhea showing off some power. It picked as you said, it did kind of speed up a little bit there toward the end. But I didn't hate this for the opener. I, I thought it was enjoyable. Yeah, it was fine, and I, like I said, I'm not. I don't want to shit on it by any means because if, if she was sick, she was sick, and you can't. There's only so much you can battle through, right? Adrenaline will only get you so far. Yeah, but I think if they had wrestled the type of match that Bailey and EO wrestled with their stakes, I think it would have been a lot better. I think the the, the Bailey and EO match was better, but they're not as big as stars as what Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch are. Right. right. So the I'm- crowd was like. Let's see. I, there's also the situation with the crowd. The, the, there's You have two separate crowds, and it may be the exact same crowd, but the crowd that was there on Saturday night was sitting in a freezing cold stadium with 15 mile an hour winds dropping that temperature by by a good 10 degrees. I mean, that's true too. Yeah. So so they did not, they weren't popping for a lot of stuff that they probably should have popped, whereas on Sunday, they you had a warmer stadium and you got a better crowd. I think that plays into a lot of it, but... Yeah, probably so. And also, WWE, uh, Philly is still a little cold in April. We're seeing some baseball games where some dudes are wearing long sleeves. Like, I know cities are kind of bidding on WrestleMania, but, like, you know, the NFL doesn't take the Super Bowl to Chicago in February for this exact reason, right? It's The weather sucks. I think Nick Khan said somewhere in one of these lead-ups to to WrestleMania and the various interviews they were doing, this was the last... 
uh, WrestleMania that he didn't have a hand in planning. And I think their plan from here on out is to do retractable roofs at, at, at worst. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And domes probably preferably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. Well, unless y'all got other thoughts, I say let's keep moving along because we got a whole bunch more to still to go. Um, next up, six-pack match for the tag team belts. A uh, little bit of a swerve here. Did any of us? I don't think any of us called Theory and Waller, did we? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay, well, congrats to you. Because <laughs> uh, I, I didn't I didn't see that one coming, but we, it was a little switched up. We thought our truth and the Miz would get the belts first, and then there would be another set of belts left, but it was kind of the reverse of that. And, and I was happy to see our truth and, and the Miz get the belts. I enjoyed this one. This one, you had your various spots. You had your, your, your moments of what the hell's going on. You had a couple weird things, but still, it was the the our truth continuing to to get those hot tags winning a match inside the match yeah I mean, yeah that was that was comical i will say maybe this is just the darby allen of it all but when you see a stunt man like darby take these like crazy bumps right and then you see the, these guys like get get fake pushed off the ladder and just kind of like fall and act like they you know, kind of choke themselves on the rope. Like it's, a, and the WWE would never do a Darby Allen spot, spot, by the way. And I'm not saying that they should, but it's just like, it's kind of weird to think about like, and I guess that's the appeal of Darby. The dude is fucking wild and crazy reckless. Cause if, if WWE had it their way and Darby Allen was in there, like, they would I don't know, it's just, they would. I mean, they they beat the shit out of Spike when he was there, and I mean, he's yeah. And Darby is just Spike two point But you get what I'm saying. Like they 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 go halfway up the ladder, and then somebody like oh oh oh, and then they just fall. They end up falling still in the ring. They don't even fall out. And like it is a spot. And I'm not saying it's it's bad or whatever. I'm just saying it's weird to watch two wrestling companies, yeah. and one is doing this, and the other one is having a dude go through a plane of glass on a twenty foot ladder. Anyway. I did like this match. I did think it got crazy in spots. Uh, I think if WWE puts effort into it, the tag team scene can be really good. And I think it's good that Grayson and Theory have the titles because they can do something with them. And I think they can have good matches. So, yeah, I mean, I like this. It was it was in a good spot and everyone got a little bit of shine and had their moment. And we got our truth in the Miz and now we have uh, Grayson and Theory. So we'll see what happens with the tag division. Yeah. Like I said earlier, you know, I'm happy for our truth and the Miz. Uh, I would have preferred to have seen the other titles go on New Catch Republic, but uh, you can't always get what you want, right? Yeah, but you got a heel, you got a heel tag team on one. You got a baby face on the other one. So, yeah, yeah. it works. And like I was saying, when I predicted this last week, I was it, the money's in the chase. Sure. For who, who, who you saying is going to be chasing Probably Grayson. a new catch. New catch. I guess a new catch. I mean, boy, they let them go for a long time before their video even played, so much so that like Michael Cole called it out and was like, oh, I guess they just forgot about these guys because they still had the Awesome Truth video playing yeah, in the background. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, it looked like it stayed up there mostly. I, I don't know if it did. It, did it ever actually change? If, yeah, the, right at the very like yeah. at the end of it, yeah. And then it kind of just kept going. So Somebody had a glitch going on in the truck. Yeah. This was a this was a fun match. I mean, other than the fact that Theory and Waller got belts, I, I mostly enjoyed this one. Um kind of a little spoiled after seeing so many AEW ladder matches, but you know, you know what to expect and what not to expect. I mean, having said that, jump ahead to Raw a little bit and Ricochet doing a 450 splash into the announce desk and landing on the front end of it. Did you oh. My Ooh. ribs hurt. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, it is. I don't think it is a coincidence that Ricochet's reassurgence has coincided the exact same time that Will Ospreay has been in AEW. I don't yeah. think it's a coincidence. And like we always talked about, I think last year on this pod when we were talking, uh, I think I said watching Ricochet is like watching a dude that you know can throw 100 miles an hour, but the manager just wants him to throw knuckleballs. <laughs> And now, under this new regime, it seems like, you know, we're, we're getting up on the radar gun a little bit with Ricochet, because this dude yeah. is a one-of-one one type of athlete. 
Yeah, like I said, he was curling. He was curling Ivar the week before, just full on curling that 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 Viking bastard. But what I really loved about that 450 was that moment where he looks over to to Samantha Irving and apologizes to her <laughs> before doing that awful landing. <laughs> I missed that. Um, do y'all got any other thoughts on the six man match? Whatever six pack, whatever they called it. I mean, it was it was cool seeing that. It, I was confused for a moment why the referee was grabbing Damian Priest's leg as he was getting ready to go up the ladder, but as the ladder buckled under under their weight, I'm like, oh, she saw that that thing was broken. Yeah, somebody. Well, you, I think you were texting me, and somebody else like there was a lot of action on Twitter about uh, somebody needs to get rid of this ladder real quick. Um, next up, Escobar and Dominic versus Ray and Andrade. Uh, Ray and Andrade get the win with a little help from Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson. Um, besides the appearance from Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson, um, which I, I pop for Jason Kelsey being there. That dude's fun as shit to watch do, doing anything. Um, this match was okay. I don't, I'm not sure it needed to be a Mania match. Um, well, I mean, this is your standard Mania match in the sense that it's your celebrity match, much like you had the one on night two. This is this is just to to give the the spectacle of not only are we a wrestling company, but we appeal to all these fancy ass people too. Yeah, and you know, I had seen a couple of days before that the, they had reached out to Kelsey and blah blah blah, and like, why why do people have to report that? That just ruins everything, <laughs> right? That's why you got to avoid that stuff. Uh, no, there's, uh, he could be a little more, more responsible with shit like that. Um, that's a conversation for another day, I guess. Like, I still got a pop for Kelsey, like, but it would have been so much cooler if I didn't know that he was going to be there. Because the moment you see... <laughs> two dudes with big bellies jump out of the crowd just pasty as shit just white as can be <laughs> right. i was trying to figure out i'm like going what the hell mask is that and then i'm like oh oh okay it's, it's a philadelphia luchador mask i mean this match was fine it, it didn't need to happen in mania um other than the for the celebrity thing like you said what what do you guys think i mean it's a minute made sponsorship yeah <laughs> that's what a lot of these matches were just like was, Let's have somebody the, so we can have to the thing. I don't even know. But it was like Alta his, Fresca because it's Minute Maid a- AF. Yeah, yeah. Which is just like okay. Uh, yeah, I don't have any thoughts on this. But it was fine. The this, Andrade, this was, the backspin and elbow is still the greatest wrestling move. It still looks beautiful. Th- this is kind of the start of where I started to come down for WrestleMania a little bit on this night. This was. This match and the next two are, are kind of, sh- and the, that next one is one that shocks to me that it didn't come off as good. But these three, if we had gotten rid of these three matches, we could have condensed WrestleMania into one night. I'm gonna give you. Let's see, my prediction is by 2027, WrestleMania is three nights. Oh Jesus! It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's on Netflix. I mean. You, you you heard the numbers of what the five, they, what is it that they did f- s- what was the interactions over the five events like 265 billion yeah they ain't they ain't letting they, they ain't about to let none of that money go so you'll see more of what you saw this year with like the main event guys being embroiled in like multiple matches with multiple stories and having stakes that's going to be the blueprint going forward and they'll book out a stadium Taylor Swift style, and they'll be there all weekend. A residency? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. So this one hurts my feelings a little bit. Um, Jay Uso versus Jimmy Us- Uso. It was they, just boring. They, they did not get Usi, did they? They did not get Usi whatsoever. Um, and it hurt, like I said, it hurts my feelings that, because I was real hyped for this one, and uh, I don't ever want to hear anybody talk about how all AEW does is super kick parties ever again in my life. Well, hold, hold on now, hold on now. The Usos have been doing super kick parties right up there with the the Bucks. So I mean, if you're if this is your first experience with an Uso super kick party, you are you are like 
You're like my wife complaining about the the Cody neck tattoo for the no, first I, time. No, I'm fine with a couple of super kicks, you know, for effect and for an exclamation point here and there. But when they went back and forth like seven or eight times, I was like, that, "Come that, on, that that is that is old school USO penitentiary stuff." Back when it they did, were still fighting with the 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 new day back in the day. I don't know, man. It just didn't have the heart I wanted it to have. And, and it sucked then. And it continues to suck now. And I'll stand by that, and the Bucks can suck it too. <laughs> but I think, Corey, what you just said got get, just explained perfectly what was wrong with it. This match had no heart, and it was two yeah. brothers. Yeah. And much like I said, like if Rhea and Becky would have wrestled the match that Bailey and EO wrestled, I think it would have been better. If Jimmy and Jay would have wrestled the match that LA Knight and AJ Styles wrestled, it would have been a lot better. And it yeah. would have made more sense for those two guys to wrestle this match. I mean, but they the closest, just didn't. The closest we got was when they were, when he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, trying to beg off. And you knew it was going to turn into betrayal. I mean, it wasn't like sure. a shock or anything, but that was the, the closest it got to to having any kind of soul. Yeah, and you know, WWE doesn't do blood for the most part in these matches, but blood would have really helped this match. Yeah. If t- the two brothers would have actually made each other bleed, but yeah, it had it. It was kind of odd that this one missed because these two guys were in the bloodline, which has been the most successful story the WWE has had in years, and all that backstory is there, and it just kind of went over like a wet fart, <laughs> which is not good. No, no, this was a. I was already feeling kind of bummed about night one. And then when this match happened, I was like, when it was done, I texted my friend, uh, Eddie, and I was like, this is kind of boring so far. I mean, it was just me, like, it didn't feel like a pay-per-view other than, like, the huge entrances, right? Yeah, it didn't feel that like it had any stakes involved in it. Yeah. Or like these two guys were brothers and they had been, been you know, they had been betraying each other. None of that. Yeah, yeah, had yeah, none yeah. of that. I mean, other than the fucking pre-match package, which was great, you know, they knock it out of the park with the pre, pre-match pre packages and then fall flat when it comes to actually putting the matches together, it feels like. It's, it's, they, they are, the, the heart and soul of what WWE does is to build emotion, make you feel something for what is about to happen. Now, a lot of times, what is about to happen, it, it, it's, it's this match. It, it falls flat. It's not what you're hoping for. It doesn't live up to your, your innate expectations. But th- they are damn good at making you care about what's about to happen. Yeah, but that's the, that's the point. The payoff doesn't. The payoff needs to, you got you to gotta nail the landing, and they're just not. Or they don't a lot, let's say. I feel like, especially with this one, I don't know. I don't want to harp on it too much because I've got really good things to say about night two. <laughs> no, but I think a lot of fans were in agreement that this was just not what they hoped it, it would be. Yeah, it, it did not live up to what we thought these two were capable of. This was this was lackluster. Yeah. It was the yeah. weakest part of this of this night, and that's saying something. Yeah, 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 for sure. All right, so let's skip to uh, Jade and Naomi and Bianca versus Damage Control. Uh, Jade, Naomi, and Bianca get the win in a pretty uneventful match. If Jay and Jimmy had not just crapped the bed right before this match, this would have been the worst match. Yeah. But because of of because there was still that big pile of crap laying right there in the middle of the uh, of the stadium, this felt hugely better than the match before. But it still was a you, hugely you, better might be generous. They're still rolling around in a pile of crap in the middle of the ring. I mean, it, this this match bugged me to, to begin with. I get that WrestleMania is all about trying to get as many people on the card as possible. But you have the tag team champions here, and it's in a throwaway six man tag. Well, I don't even know why Bianca acted like damage control was a threat because we just watched two years of her beating the shit out of all three of them, all four of them by herself. <laughs> so I don't know why this, when she had 
back up in Naomi and Jade, this was supposed to be any different. Uh, I will say that the damage control entrance was pretty cool. That's about the only thing good in this match. was the, I, I liked the entrance with the fans. I thought it was timed really well, and it came really good across the screen. But other than that, and other than Jade Cargill looking like a million bucks, like, yeah, this kind of just was there. I had a dumbass moment with this match. It took me a moment to realize she was she was Storm with the white hair and and all the the storm is coming and they're they're channeling the x-men on that one and that it it makes me angry that took me as long as it did to realize that were they not doing that at the end of her AEW run or did i miss that i don't think they were oh i think they just started the storm is coming and then uh who else had on x-men gear that day oh there was black panther gear in the uh, nxt match yeah trick mellow yeah, Trick Mello had. Uh, we can get to that one, that match later too. I have a couple thoughts about it, but yeah, this one was. Uh, this was not a good match. Like I said, didn't the, need to be on Mania. These last three matches, you get rid of them, and you wouldn't have yeah. missed a thing. This could, this would have been generic pay per view match. Right, right, right. So I, I, let's ramp it up a little bit and get into Gunther versus Sammy. Um, I don't think any of us had Sammy actually win. I, I had Sammy. I wanted Sammy to win. I didn't think they would pull the trigger on it. Um, I popped like hell seeing KO waiting for him. Dude, slap the shit out of him to psych him up. <laughs> yeah. That's what you here need, for man. That's what here you for need. It. Uh, and I didn't make the connection. Like, I, you know, I saw the Rocky trunks. I was like, oh, he's got the, the Apollo Creed trunks. And then Eddie texts me. He's like, uh, did you catch the reference? I was like, what are you talking about? He said, when Chad said that if you win, you owe me a favor. I was like, no, what's that from? He's like, straight out of like Rocky two or three and all the stuff with like his wife talking shit in the crowd and everything else. There was like several Rocky moments there. Uh, so I thought that was cool, but I was just happy to see Sammy win. I honestly didn't think it, they would do it. And then when they said that he was on day 666, I was like, ain't no way WWF or WWE is going to repeat 666 days for as long as they have to reference this title. Oh, they did it. Damn straight. My, mind you, you got Sammy saying, you know, forgive me for saying it after right after it, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you I, I've already talked about how happy I am with with this this one, and it, and this was a good match. It was not only exciting to see Sammy get the win. I thought it was a good match. The, uh, what do you guys think? This was best match on this night, hands down. I think this was my favorite moment of both nights hmm. because, like like Stephen and I were talking before Corey, you got on here. I think a lot of the reason why night one fell a little flat is because there was like no stakes involved in anything nothing felt like it really mattered that much until you got to the sammy gunther match and you start with the camera in the back with sammy and his family and sammy is so good about just delivering heartfelt passion like like wrestling matters to him and it matters what he does And for all the pop and circumstance of WrestleMania, the big entrances, all this sort of stuff, to me, by far, the best entrance of WrestleMania was Sammy coming into the ring. Because you start with his family, and you can tell he kind of believes in himself, but he kind of doesn't. He has a little moment with his wife where he's looking at his kid, and he says, hey, if it goes wrong out there, don't bring him back here because I don't want him to see me like this. And then he walks and you get the slow build and it's just quiet. He's alone by himself. And then you get the Chad Gable moment. Then you get the KO moment. And then you come out and you get the the massive crowd. And then here comes Gunther and with the stark white and the red. And he looks just like a badass. And I thought they told just a beautiful story in the ring. And like beat the hell out of him. And this is all I've ever wanted WWE to be. And they've gotten better at it recently. I'm a fan of wrestling because wrestling is like important to me. And so I want the characters on the screen and the moments that are happening to also feel like they're important. And they nailed it with this match, like 10 out of 10 flying colors. I, like I said, I think this, I thought this was the best, you know, obviously you have to contrast it a lot with the car crash spectacle. That is the night two main event with the bloodline, but like to me, Sammy and Gunther is it's everything I want wrestling to be. And I thought it was, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. 
what what I think Sam, as we were saying, Sammy is a master at getting you behind him, wanting him to succeed, wanting him to get his face punched in. Whatever he is trying to do, he is an ex he is an expert at making that emotional connection with people, and him just the way he just does those epileptic kind of flips trying to get his ass off the floor to will himself to continue after just the pounding and the pounding it just pulls you in it just makes you want to you you it's the reality of of this stuff that i mean we all know there's an athleticism to him but we all know that you know this isn't athletic competitions in the sense of you don't know who's going to win. They knew who was going to, you, you know who, how these things are going to play out, but he makes you feel like there's a, there's a realness to it that some of the, some of the other matches just don't have to him. I say this a lot is that a lot of people in wrestling play like they're wrestlers and he plays like an actual athlete and a person who is, trying to to win he does not come off as fake or phony in the least and gunther is the was the perfect opponent for this gunther's matches also like the physicality of it it he he, you can't help but have a good match when you're wrestling against gunther because when he starts chopping you and he starts laying that stuff in it, it gives a visceral reaction to the fans and you can't help but lean forward and start paying attention and he's a Gunther is a master at that. I think he's top five wrestler in the world. Uh, I can't wait to see what he does on the main event scene. This felt like a send off of the mid card, and here we go. You know, Cody's going to need some opponents. That upper or the the main event level scene is going to need some heels, and I think he is ready to just step right into that role and yeah. succeed. They already kind of have a history too with the Rumble last year, being the last two, et cetera. Yeah, you know. Yep. Uh, yeah, that'll be fun if if they. I don't know how immediately you put him into something like that, but if Seth's going to be out for a while, I mean, Gunther would make a worthy first big opponent for Cody, right? I, I think they do Randy Orton first. That's my prediction. But I, yeah, Gun- I think Gunther is there because you've got the the other title that's going to be predominantly on Raw. I think Cody is going to be more giving the SmackDown guys their their moments oh I gotcha. oh my other prediction is I think that's gonna flip I think Damien gets drafted to Smackdown and Cody's gonna stay on Raw cause Netflix didn't buy Raw to not have Cody Rhodes in that title <laughs> on that program true true um y'all got any more thoughts on that one or you wanna move on to the main event cause I figure we'll spend a little more time here well I just wanna how bad was Kevin Dunn at his job <laughs> the dude has been gone for a couple of months, and now all of a sudden these these guys are do they're doing damn tracking shots, they're doing long takes, like they're acting like they've actually watched a modern day movie and that's been made from the past twenty five years where like filmmakers are actually doing creative things and they're like why don't we just do it like that? Even last night on Monday Night Raw, Liv jumps Rhea and I don't know if you guys were watching but the camera goes into Rhea and Dominic like get out of here and he smashes the the lens and the lens does a transition like yeah, bro that okay. stuff that's like filmmakers well, have been doing for uh, like a while now and like just because you're a live event in WWE doesn't mean you can't do it and they just my, Kevin Dunn for whatever reason had a vision of wrestling like it was damn 1982 still and now some fresh blood has gotten in there and it's livened up the production. This is a, a statement I... Bef- in my my long ago days, I used to do a job that required me to work with a lot of contractors, and they would be get into into a, a deal with the the organizations, and they'd be there for years. And the people would start going, "Well, they're not doing what they used to do." Kevin Dunn was that contractor that had been in a relationship for a long period of time, so he didn't have to do anything new. He had gotten comfortable with the the person yeah. that that he made one person happy, and that was it. And as long as that one person was happy, he was going to not do a damn thing other than just sit there and, and push the exact button that he needed to push. Yeah, he was either resting on his laurels or he was afraid to take a chance and mess something up uh, instead of taking a chance to try to get a good shot where we've got people talking about creative 
on a show about wrestling, right? Yeah, and like wrestling had, but the thing that kills me about it is that wrestling does have a history of like revolutionizing how sports are broadcasted. Like pro wrestling was one of the first things that was on TV in America in the night post World War II. Like world class championship wrestling had the camera in the ring. Like people in wrestling history have taken chances. And it just seemed like these past 20 ish years, at least in the broadcast way, it's just been frozen in time, which is unfortunate. And now all that's gone. And so now, you know, it. they even had the different camera. I don't know if you guys noticed the different camera quality when it cuts, when they were doing the introductions with Samantha Irvin. Like there's all kinds of technology out there. You can do all kinds of shit, but you have to be yeah, creative see- and willing. It seems like they're using some of those, like the NFL started doing it a few years ago. When somebody scores a touchdown, they've got a different grade of camera. That's exactly where they got it. Yeah, it's like a Sony A7S little camera you can put on a gimbal with yeah. a with a live stream little connection thing. And yeah, it worked great. Well, whatever camera they used for that was not the same camera that on night two, Logan Paul was shooting his selfie on from that that prime truck because that one was garbage. I think that was his actual cell phone with on cell phone signal. And yeah, you got to be careful about that stuff when there's 78,000 people in an arena. Cell phone it's signal, a little spotty. Fight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's get into the main event then. And so we can spend a little time there before we go to night two. Roman and The Rock versus Cody and Seth. Uh, got an F bomb slipped through from the rock. I don't know if they just missed the dump button or if they let it slide because it was a pay per view. And it uh, was the perfect F bomb. Uh, there were some good moments, some bad moments. Uh, Roman completely missed a cutter that he was supposed to take, and it looked very terrible. Um, but I was still mostly entertained. Uh, and then the rock got the fucking pin. And then we had some back and forth about this, and uh, I I said this via text. I said, also, uh, LOL at his fucking belt that he brought to the ring. He's no better than Hook at this point. I did not know at that point that Muhammad Ali's wife had given him the belt, but uh, it's still an unsanctioned title, and he's walking around with it like it's something. And I think the only point really was to so that Cody would be the only one in the ring without a belt. Oh, yeah. This is, this is I mean... I take offense at the fact that he's no better than Hook because th- them there is fighting words. You know what I mean. But the, I don't. I don't mean like physically or not, like not, I'm, uh, even with these belts. I take offense at that because the FTW title. Hook is a good guy. He is carrying a meaningless belt for no reason other than to to make himself look important. That is not a good guy thing. The Rock is a complete bona fide jackass that you're supposed to hate. So he's got this belt that is designed to make you think he just gave himself a jackass belt. So it is the perfect belt for him. And the fact that, you know, he's making it seem like they didn't just pay Muhammad Ali's widow to give him a a, a stupid belt, it makes it even better. Yeah, I don't think Muhammad Ali ever carried that belt. (laughs) (laughs) He never carried a belt that had a bull on the front of it. But nevertheless, I want to give, I think the MVP of both of these nights, the main event, and I gave this dude a little bit of shit a couple weeks ago, but he redeemed himself. Seth Rollins did masterful work across both of these nights. His ability to convey emotion, his selling ability, um... The grand entrances on both nights, particularly night two with the, the, the that I mean that I love that that was fantastic. Um, I think I blurted well on night one when he walked out. What in the fuck is this man wearing to the ring? Yeah, he uh he he was great across both nights, and um I know some people had you know had some qualms about the night one main event. I thought it was I didn't see anything wrong with. It. I thought it was great. Um. It made sense why the referee couldn't do anything. Um, the Rock played his part well. Roman, I thought all these four of these guys did a, did a good job. I noticed some of the missed spots like you did, like the cutter that kind of yeah. turned into the coffin drop esque, yeah, neck breaker, whatever the hell it was supposed to be. Uh, um, you know, but yeah, I mean, I thought overall, it was good. yeah, I mean, it served its purpose, right? Yeah, 
this and I talked about this a couple times on on this weekend and I'm this is an AEW versus WWE thing. The things that bother me in AEW are the fact that they don't obey their own rules. Where like, you know, the referee's discretion. I bitched about that. On 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 this one, we had a referee discretion moment, but it made sense storyline because you had the board member out there telling the referee that if you count that fucking pen, I'll fire you. And that's perfect because it's a storyline. You can't obey the rules. They're establishing that stuff. If AEW would just spend some time doing those little things of making their continuity, making their rules match, they would. I, I'd, I'd love it so much more. I don't disagree with that. I think, I mean, that, that's a fair take. I don't really have anything to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, this was this was a good way to end the night. It went it went the way we expected. Um, it didn't feel as big as I thought it would, but it still felt like a good match and a good way to end the night. I, I was trying to explain this to to my wife over here because she had kind of had that same feeling you did of she wanted something more, she expected more, she wanted those bigger stakes, and I, I was trying to explain it as this is the the end game kind of moment where you're getting that snap and people are disappearing it's yes it's important but what it's really doing is establishing that final moment for the next big movie and thankfully that movie was only one night away i I think part of the reason it didn't feel big is i i think they made one little misstep in that i don't think cody and seth should have been like quote unquote conscious for the end of wrestlemania I think they both should have left them laying face down, middle of the ring. We're going yeah. off the air with all of the bloodline in the ring. I think Jimmy should have come out there. Solo should have come out there. It's everybody. We have. There's no way in hell the Cody Rhodes is going to win this title come night two. Look at what just happened. Instead of going off with the fireworks and Cody looking distraught yeah. and Seth looking distraught. I did like that they did the same camera angle that they did last year of Cody sitting there in the ring with his back facing Roman and The Rock as they both head up the aisle. That was a neat callback. Yeah, but I kept um, I kept waiting for them to like whip them with the belt more, and it just didn't. Yeah, it did. They just walked out. So, but so overall, I think we kind of touched on it. We all kind of. I don't want to say I don't I don't know. Let is let down the right word. I was let down a little bit by night one. It, I just it had a couple of moments here and there, but it just did not feel like mania to me. This I wouldn't say I was let down. Um, I think last year we had a similar situation where one night was better than the other, and I think we're, you're perpetually going to have that no matter how many nights it is. Sure. But from a WrestleMania perspective, WrestleMania, while it's a spectacle in general, it's there's only been one or two matches at any given WrestleMania that is like, yeah. So, I mean, WrestleMania as a whole is one of those those things where people forget how much of a letdown the, the previous WrestleMania was. So, I, I, to me, this in, this one isn't in the anywhere near the, the, the worst WrestleManias I've ever seen. No, I think that, you know, a lot of people, it is world wrestling entertainment, but the, the E should really come before that second W. Uh, you're not going to get, you know, there are three, four matches a year where you really go, holy shit, that was a hell of a wrestling match. Most of it's just like, it, it ranges between like, eh, to decent. Yeah. Well, let's get on into night two then. Um, started out with a bang. Drew versus Seth. Drew wins in what felt like a pretty quick match. I felt like that one... You know, I blinked and looked up, and Drew's got the win. Uh, he managed to sneak in a tweet from the crowd. I thought that was funny as hell. Um, and then afterward, uh, Drew and Punk are talking shit, and Punk gets into it with Drew, knocks him out with his arm brace or whatever, and then uh, you hear the Judgment Day music. Priest cashes in. Finally, re- re- finally learns what to do and how to use the the briefcase. Right? Yeah, I love how just... I love how WWE was like. Oh, a lot of people have been critical of Damien because blah blah blah. As if they didn't write him to be a bumbling idiot 
like as if they're not the ones decided to do that. It's like the fans were only responding to what was happening, which was you were riding that every time this dude came down, somebody kicked him in the face. Like we didn't, yeah. we didn't, we didn't make that narrative. You, you made the narrative. You're the ones that did it. <laughs> that, or he acted like he didn't know what he was supposed to do, and now all of a sudden he hands it directly. The refs got it in his hands, and he <laughs> yeah. says, "I want to cash this in right now." Yeah. So, but on the plus side, all those bumblings and the people kicking him in the face is a dude he just swiped the title from, which makes it, you know, feel a little bit more important that that. He might get the title taken away from him by that same dude. Yeah, I mean, I will reserve judgment on how successful Damian Priest's World Heavyweight Championship run is going to be when it ends. But um, I was not, and I was not happy. I wasn't happy. That's not, I didn't really care. But I, if you look at where the title has just come from with being Seth Rollins. To then have it go to a guy like Damian Priest is a letdown, because <laughs> I think everyone would be much interested in Drew McIntyre and CM Punk fighting over the title. Now, obviously, that probably has a lot to do with the fact that Punk's probably not 100% heel right now, so you kind of have to do things. You have to, you know, do something else there, and maybe you don't want your title uh, held hostage while you're trying to wait for that match. But regardless... Um, I, I, think, I just I just don't buy him as a champion. That's just me personally. I think this is designed to do two things. What, the first thing it was designed to do was give Drew McIntyre his his first win in front of seventy two thousand people, and it did that. And he looked great. He looked apart. The the next thing this is designed to do is to give Drew his win in front of what thirty thousand people in Scotland, and that could be uh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't Cause, hate that. Because we're now two, what, two months away from that? Yeah, and I mean, it's. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing coming off the the run of Roman Reigns holding that title for, or holding a title for forever, to kind of hot shot some other titles around just a little bit. And see, that this one doesn't bother me in that sense because the way Damian won it wasn't through a legitimate match kind of thing, so... While he has the title right now, until he establishes himself as a, a champion that can retain it, Drew taking it right back from him is is perfectly fine with me as far as that. He's a guy who's he's Icarus in that he's out he's out outflown his reach. Well, he's yeah. also no offense. I don't think he's that good, but that's <laughs> might, might be me being a little harsh. Uh, he's he's just generic generic big guy to me. Uh, semi-related, can I just say that Sean Ross Sapp is on fire with his damn tweets? Because, like, in this match, he's like, a, you know, you get you get Drew with a, the board at work tweet during the match. So he wins the belt. Sean is like, hey, congratulations. Three minutes later, never mind. And I, I popped at that. Or when he's, like, dealing with Chelsea Green on Raw, it's like, is this the whole match? It only says, like, 37 seconds. You must be kidding, right? <laughs> I mean... It's he's he's just full of snark and it is beautiful at times. I don't yeah, I my 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 problem with Sean Ross Sapp is putting everything behind a paywall. But if somebody wants to pay for that info instead of waiting the extra ten minutes that it's gonna take for somebody to copy and paste it into the squared circle, then good for them. Uh but I don't need to go on a rant about Sean Ross Sapp, I don't guess. Um, where were we? You were. I got mad. About, I got mad about SRS for a minute. You got quiet, uh, angry there for just a second. Just the the yeah. rage built up inside. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. I want to talk about Seth and his run, and we we've talked about him being a fighting champion, and you were talking about the emotion earlier, Patrick, and he showed you know a lot of emotion at the end of this one. It's like you kind of feel bad for the guy because I mean. It, Maybe not for right now because he's fixing to get a month off. But uh, you know, we 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 were t- touting him before they came up with this championship because we were we had an episode called "Let's Put Some Respect on Seth's Name," and then they introduce this new championship and he gets it and he he he's out there every week fighting somebody or challenging some you know like he's there every week and 
was able to do a job that Roman hasn't done uh, in the last year or a year and a half or so. Yeah, and but he's had his moments, though. Like, you know, we talked about right when this The Rock, Cody, Roman, Seth thing were going down. We were like, man, Seth, especially at the press conference, like, man, Seth's not bringing it. He needs to change his tone. But then that sure, yeah. then that switch to Roman wasn't bringing it. And um, I think, you know, I think history is going to look back fondly on Seth Rollins. I'm talking like his career's over. He's going to be back in fucking a month. But, like, <laughs> he, he is going to be remembered as, like, a dude who influenced the next generation of wrestlers. Um, yeah. So he, he, he is the macho man of this generation and that's not a bad thing to be at all. I loved macho man when I was a kid. People still love macho man. You see way more macho man shirts up there than you see Hogan shirts. <laughs> oh shit. I didn't even see that you were wearing a, Steven's wearing a macho <laughs> man shirt for listeners out there. Uh, Hell yeah. but yeah, you see a lot more of those than you see of uh, any Hulk Hogan stuff. And, People wrestle like Dragon Steamboat and Savage's match from WrestleMania three. A lot of modern day wrestling looks like that. It does not look like Hogan and Andre. So I think there's something to be said with that too, between the parallels between Seth Rollins and uh, Roman Reigns. Let's move on to uh, Final Testament versus Street Profits and Bobby Lashley. Uh, Snoop Dogg is on commentary, made it totally worth it. Um, and my final note was more entertaining than I expected, but that probably had more to do with Snoop Dogg than the match. And then uh, they got a hold of a faulty table at one point. <laughs> they tried to put a cross on it. It just fell yeah. immediately. Uh, but, I, you know, this was my least anticipated match of the evening. Um this this is night two celebrity match and it was a it was more enjoyable than night one match to me but that's because I th- as we were talking earlier I think this was fresher because we hadn't just seen this match last year and Snoop was on commentary what does Montez Ford need to do for that company to see him in a different light I don't know I'd be fucking mad we have been waiting two years for this guy to break out every single article where it's like who's the next breakout star he's on that list in this match he showed out yet again and yet he continues to just be saddled with these like ho-hum stories where no the fans really don't care because nothing really important happens also am I crazy did did Street Profits come after Private Party because they feel like just a private party ripoff and they're not as entertaining as private party I think Street Profits were, per- were first I think they were first were they? I think so I could be wrong about that I need to look that up um, I don't know man it's just it's not working for me and I, I'm like you I, Montez Ford is clearly the star of the that group like wh- at what point do they pull the trigger on letting him do his own thing yeah I don't you know Coming off of the success that Cody has had leaving WWE and coming back, coming off the success that McIntyre had leaving WWE and coming back, I don't. Does Montez need to do that? Does he need to go do a stint in Japan to have the company see him in a different light? Like I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. It's just kind of crazy to me where you're looking at him and you're like, he has everything you want why is he still in this tag team and why is he in matches and storylines that nobody cares about? I, I, don't, I don't know. know. I, I just looked up the Street Profits formation and it looks like they debuted on July 12th, 2017. So they've been around longer. Well, Independent Circuit Private Party made their debut at House of Glory on August 21st of 2015. Okay. Well, there you go. And I'll be damned. Well, step it up, y'all, because your your little brother is making you look bad in terms of presentation. Uh, yeah, well, I say let's move on because I want to talk more about the other stuff, unless y'all got any more to say about that match. Nope. AJ Styles versus LA Knight. Our boy Knight gets the win. Um, and like you guys were talking about earlier, the it felt like there was more at stake in this one, right? Yeah, because they didn't lock up. He AJ came right down the ramp and started throwing bows. Like this is like I said 
earlier. This is what Jimmy and Jay should have been ripping up the came to my ripping up the mat. Yeah, you came to my house. I still had Christmas lights up. <laughs> uh, you know, big spot for LA Knight. He gets the win. Uh, and fast forward to the end, he is one of the baby faces in the ring with Cody Rhodes. I still think that U.S. title is there for him to win. I still think that is going to be the match at some point with Logan Paul. Uh, but yeah, this was I like this match. I like the physicality of it. I like the ripping up the mat and the concrete and everything like that. I, lo- I liked all of it. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, I'm 100 same kind of opinion. This this was the it, it wasn't the best match of the night, but it was a solid, you know, entertaining match for exactly those reasons. Of it, it had that that aggressiveness that the the Usos didn't have. Yeah, and you know, at first I was bummed that I, I was like, oh, it's just going to be AJ and LA Knight. But A, they put on a hell of a match. B, it was super entertaining. And C, friend of the show, again, I, I'll refer to him all the time. Uh, Eddie said, you know, AJ Styles can make anybody look like a million bucks. Uh, and he did a good job of putting Knight over that night, I thought. Um, got more out of this match than I initially thought I was going to get, honestly. They stepped it up. That's that's the difference. Is they understood that the assignment. This is WrestleMania. You, you don't you don't bring the the your non A game. Yeah. Yeah, and and what was an overall much better night? This was just one of the reasons why I thought. Um, Patrick, you got any other thoughts before we move on? No, I mean they they did smart by you know wrestling a different type of match there were no lockups they were like we're going to be the spot where we go in and it's 100 miles an hour from the start and we're going to rip up the mat and you know let everything land a little bit snug it was and a fight. that's our spot yeah it's a fight they they were both actually throwing haymakers as opposed to what we saw at the uh press junket the other day where they were just kind of wrestling around grappling each well other. la came to that press conference with a very aggressive hug and like i put in our group <laughs> chat like if you're gonna try to sucker punch somebody you actually need to sucker punch them not just grab them by the neck and uh aj hit him with a couple of high singles where you know i don't know I, you know if this was a real fight between aj styles and la Knight, i think seeing the the wrestling moves i think i'd put my money on aj styles that old dog still got it he's got it but if you're looking at the the outcome of that little press conference thing, only one of them was bleeding their own blood. <laughs> yeah, but if this is on the streets, I think I think L.A. would be asleep because I think that high single wouldn't it, it would have went all the way through, uh, head off hey, the concrete. Yeah, AJ's from Georgia, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, ain't nobody breaking this redneck. Uh, yeah. Um, so KO versus Orton versus Logan Paul. Uh, <laughs> Lo- Lo- Logan comes out with that big ass prime truck and then KO comes out with a golf cart that he's taped KO to the front of I laughed so fucking hard and then he backs it all the way back up the ramp to, to go get Randy Orton and Randy Orton telling him to slow down slow down as he speeds down the ramp that shit entertained the hell out of me this, this is the match that I had the most fun with yeah just, it was a fun match. I mean, I hate the outcome, but we knew it was coming. Uh, as you pointed out, I think over the weekend, like you got to have that belt around Logan Paul, uh, his waist or on his shoulder when he goes to the ring with his brother to fight Mike Tyson. Right? Yep. And then you take it off him after that, maybe, with LA Knight. But yeah, this was fun. It was a fun, you know, the the the... They, them, the two of them continually backdropping Logan onto the the announce table was fun, uh, and all all of it's great. Like Logan, I said it, I've said it before. He just, I, I don't know if he was a wrestling fan growing up, but he just gets it. He's just a natural at this. It comes so effortlessly to that guy. That the there's certain things that you have to do in wrestling with Sammy and Gunther. They, they showed off a style, but what I said there was that they showed off Sammy's personality in that. This match also showed off 
a little bit of the, those personalities too, where you've got Rand with the backdrop thing where Randy's kind of giving him a, the lesson class of, no, you got to lift him up higher when you're dropping him on this. Or, <laughs> or, or when Logan in the ring going, shoving him and be like, yeah, you two fight. And they're just like, you know, nah, we're still going to whip your ass until the moment where they, they kind of pause and being good guys, they kind of have that moment, which entertained the crap out of me of, uh, are we going to do this now? We're going to do this now? Okay, let's do this now. And then, you know, friends fighting friends. And that was, yeah. that. that's that's the kind of stuff that entertains me is being able to see, to see the, the, the personalities come out. Kevin Owens is a master at smack talking in the ring. And there's only one other person that does it anywhere close to him. And that's, and I, it scares me to say this, and that's Roman Reigns. Because Roman Reigns will talk some shit on you in the ring. Yeah. K- KO is the perfect, and we've said this before too, like if you were going to be a wrestler, I think that's who you want to be. And that's the spot you want to be. Because like you can do this match. And like if they wanted to, in four weeks, if they turned Kevin Owens heel and had him face to face with Cody Rhodes, he would not feel out of place. He would look like he belonged. He is just, he's so good at doing this. And I, I mean, I, this is not a crazy thing to say. Like, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. This dude is one of the best of his generation. Yep. Uh, and it's kind of crazy to think about because if you go back to Kevin Steen, Ring of Honor, I don't know if you could have foreseen this in his future. You know, I, I you could have easily imagined a future where he, Kevin Steen is a forever indie darling and you know crazy to think about that <laughs> everything he did as he moved up in scale just continued to work and he's not really doing anything different than what he was doing in 2012 in Ring of Honor he, he's just taken it a little bit slower and made it mean more yeah that's, that's, all, that's all he's really done his look hasn't changed he's got the same damn look got the same the same catchphrases are the same the moves are the same it's just now he's doing it in front of 70,000 people as opposed to 5,000 people yeah I mean always uh, find an excuse to get KO on a on a big show like that because he's always going to perform right yep and I love that the the Sammy hype up of him still ended with him slapping the shit out of Sammy again (laughs) I'm here for it. Yeah. Listen, you got to slap. Sometimes, listen, if you're going to try to hit a big PR or you're doing something physical, like get slapped in the face a little bit. If y'all have never seen the the YouTube clip of, I think it was John Henderson, defensive tackle for the Jaguars in like the mid-2000s. It's a pretty viral clip of him just yelling. And he was like six foot five, 320 pounds. And this little... Uh, physical therapist guy, one of the trainers on the team, like five foot six. He's just slapping the shit out of John Henderson just pregame, just as hard as he can. And John's just screaming because I mean, you, yeah, you need that sometimes. Just get a little, get it amped up. It would have been funny if he'd had smelling salts though. That's the next thing. We've done the slap, and now it's time for the smelling salts before the guy goes out to the ring. Smelling salts. I haven't thought about that that in forever. Yeah, I used to see those all the time and like stuff in the eighties. Oh, they're making they're really making a comeback, games. bro. There's all these like 16 year old kids out there trying to hit deadlift PRs, and somebody gives them some smelling salts right before. Jesus Christ! All right, so let's get into Bailey versus Eo Sky. We talked about the stakes in this one earlier. Uh, I think we all had Bailey win in this one, um, so it was nice to see her get that one. Uh, and they said this was her first singles match at at WrestleMania, so I guess all her other matches have been tags or other things right or three ways or what have you yeah yeah interesting is she egyptian did we know no. that no she is not okay she's uh she's uh <laughs> she's just walking like one okay th- th- this All was right. a big topic over here <laughs> no she is not there, there is a egyptian museum from her in her area where she grew up in california where she is a mexican-american Martinez is that last name. Yep. Gotcha. Not very Egyptian. All right. Well, that's a choice, I guess. <laughs> 2024. I mean, I didn't hate it, but I was like, I didn't think she was Egyptian. But whatever. Did not. Uh, I like the match, though. Uh, you know, 
every once in a while, EO's got to remind people that she's actually one of the best women's wrestlers in the world. And the fluidity she has in the ring and some of the stuff that with the counters that they were doing, um, they got real technical. And, I, you know, I geek out for that kind of shit. So I really like this match a lot. Can you imagine how much more this would have been? In, in, I mean, this was a fun match, but think about how much more it would have been on that entertainment level had Damage Control and EO been built this way throughout her entire run. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that we talked about on this podcast. EO should have been beating people up, making them tap out. Every time she turned around, she was getting smacked in the face by somebody <laughs> while she was the women's champion. She'd be on the screen. You'd be like, oh, I forgot that she was the women's champion because all the other heels are out of the ring and she's the one getting the shit beat out of her. Makes zero sense whatsoever. So, uh, I mean, yeah, they def- I, I personally think they failed eo in the booking of this leading up to wrestlemania that being said that's not on her she can't control that what she can control is how she goes out there and wrestles and i think these two women did a fantastic job yeah yeah good stuff uh so the last match of the night cody versus roman the first interferee was jimmy uso and then jay stepped in to take him out and this is when you think all hell's about to break loose right So, uh, Solo is next, and the big rumor was that WWE signed Jacob Fatu, and he pulled out of a GCW event on, he was supposed to be in Saturday night, right? So, everybody's like, okay, well, he's going to step in somewhere along the way. I'm looking forward to it. Give me some Samoan werewolf. (laughs) But then, Cena's music hit. Cena comes in. It kind of made sense because he and Solo had a thing last year, right? Uh, at least briefly. And then we get The Rock. And then the Shield music hits. And this is when I moved up in the front of my seat. Because I was like, at first I was like, okay, we've been, they'd been teasing Stone Cold. We, but we, all three of us thought Stone Cold was going to be there. So this was the time for Stone Cold. But then the Shield, the Shield music hits. So I, I'm scooching up. I'm like, oh, somehow they worked out a deal to get Seth. Or is it not Seth? Uh, John Moxley. And I'm I'm just on the edge of my seat, on the edge of my seat. And then here comes Seth in the shield gear, which was cool. Especially because he had that line a month or two ago about I'll be, you know, I'll be your shield or whatever, etc. And then he immediately gets popped in the face, taking the attention for, away from Cody when Roman could have hit Cody with the chair, right? Well, that, so Seth's knocked the fuck out. The, the, we had we had kind of slept on this this part of that story, in the sense that we had been focused on Cody finishing his story, but there was a huge subplot in this 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 match that came with that moment. We we get that redemption of Seth Rollins, where his all the things that he did in the past that made him that that rat bastard came back he paid his dues he's now at that moment where he can exist outside of what he was and i think that's kind of cool yeah and then the wild card for the evening was the 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 undertaker music hits and i gotta give credit to my wife here because i was i was we were sitting there we were talking about this and she's like i bet you the undertaker shows up and i'm like there ain't no way in hell the undertaker showing up tonight and she gave me the biggest I told you so look, and I just had to sit there and just, you know, eat eat a big old, you know, I told you so sandwich. Patrick, you've been looking like you wanted to say something for a minute. I mean, why, why take her? I have an answer. Okay, give it to me. And, and this is not my answer. This, is, this comes directly from one Mike Mizan. They had uh, Mike. Uh, they had the Miz and uh, R Truth on Pat McAfee's show uh, on Monday, and they were they were talking. And the way the Miz put it is is it made so much sense. The Undertaker is the epitome of the WWE locker room leader. If you have the Undertaker's approval on something, you are you have 
the entire backing of whoever because he has been that authority figure backstage since the beginning. He is the guy that everybody kind of looked to for those those locker room leaderships. And while Stone Cold is important to, to do, The Undertaker is more WWE. Okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, all right cool yeah but it's the rock so it either needs to be stone cold or it, it, it okay here's i guess here's what i was thinking if you are not going to do stone cold just any creative if we're if the three of us are in the writer's room and triple h goes we can't get stone cold then i think my suggestion would be okay triple h it needs to be you coming down to the ring you don't have to get physical but you and the rock have already we've already established this thing because you came out on smackdown post the press conference and said the rock may be on the board but this is i basically run this show i'm still calling the shots you have a little interaction and then since you can't get physical maybe the rock pushes you or something you look to the back and out comes Kevin Owens and out comes Sammy and out comes LA Knight and out comes all the baby faces that were there in the middle of the ring to hoist Cody up and they all take the rock out also did the Miz explain why the taker couldn't be bothered to put on any sort of gear well that I'm okay with that I'm okay with if the taker's gonna come back he doesn't need to be in the gear yeah, he, he's he's no longer the dead man. He is just yeah. straight up the retired Mark Calloway, formerly known as The Undertaker. Okay. But I think if The Rock is going to be the, the final boss, then I don't... If you were not going to do Stone Cold, because it makes sense, I don't know if you waste taking out The Rock with somebody else who, at some point down the line, can't feel The Rock's wrath. So like a Sammy, a Kevin, an LA Knight, those guys could still be there, but they could still be like, fuck it, Cody's our guy. You're, we're taking you out. You're done. Just a suggestion. Did did Undertaker have a moment with Cody at some point before this, or was that uh, Bray Wyatt? That was the Bray Wyatt thing. Okay. I couldn't remember if he had had a... Uh a past meeting or something. I, I I like your idea there of having Triple H come do it, but he's he said he's not he's done. He's got he's got his pacemaker, he's got his jump starter, he's he's not gonna do any of that stuff anymore. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He doesn't have to get physical, but like we, we but, have we have established the rock and triple H are not on the same side in storyline. But, but I think I, I I don't know if I would have brought the other dudes out there because I think that's something you you I kinda like that idea, but at the same token you shove Triple H he he he's he starts to do something but instead the lights go out and then the undertaker kind of standing up for that would have been just as fine for me i'm fine with the undertaker being there I, do i think stone cold would have been better yes but i think undertaker is just as good but I, I saw well, well no, undertaker's not just as good come on no he's not just okay. as good he's 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 fine he's not stone cold that that place was waiting for the glass to break the uh, who was it Vince Russo I think says said the reason why is bro Stone Cold Steve he's protective of his image bro he ain't gonna just be out there if it was just the one person Steve would have been out there no it's that the money didn't get right that's not bullshit (laughs) (laughs) this comes down to dollar signs (laughs) the money wasn't right for the man hey I respect it but you know I think biggest Wrestlemania of all time you know you give Steve hey we'll you know, whatever Steve's number was, if it's not astronomical, eh, you know, maybe give it to him. But that being said, we're picking nits. This the main event was 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 great. It was awesome. It was a car crash. It was a spectacle. This is what WWE does. This was the end of Avengers, and I think they they pulled it off beautifully. Oh, did did it also feel a little short to y'all, or was that just me? I felt like it was a little short, uh, shorter than it. This was long to me. Really? Yeah, I was surprised that they like started wrestling. I thought that we were immediately going to come out, and here comes Solo, and here comes Jimmy, and here we go. Yeah, I, I really that's the what I thought. Rules didn't come in till like real late into where I thought it was going to. Yeah, I don't. Uh, it was but, weird. I, but this, I learned. I learned this weekend that one of my wife's favorite things is when the music hits and the people come just full tilt down the down the ramp. Like Jay coming for Jimmy, <laughs> just that excitement instead of instead of people just fucking around. She like she she was yelling. She's like, 
go. Like when Jay comes just hauling ass. I mean, Cena hit a dead sprint. He That man did not break stride. Just straight going through the whole thing. This when I was talking about the people talking trash, this is a this match was a perfect example of Roman Reigns talking some shit when he hit the crossroads. I don't know if you caught what he said. He's like, "I knew that move sucked. Ain't nobody gonna get pinned to this move. Nobody want to match off a of crossroads, only to like immediately get hit with those three crossroads to lose." It was yeah. It's it's that shit talk that I love. And the the Seth moment was was I thought was a, yeah. was such a nice cherry on top. Like the fact that this man has been so all Roman ever wanted to be was was acknowledged. Roman is the insecure guy, and so he just wanted to stay in the shield for forever and be with his buddies. And the fact that Seth did the turn on him, and it literally ate him alive so much that in the biggest moment of his life, instead of going for the win and hitting Cody, he decides to get his revenge. And let it come full circle. I love that's it. that's great storytelling. And like, I've seen a lot of people. Uh, well, I guess what I'm about to say now is going to be kind of a. It's not necessarily meant to be a dig at WWE. I've seen a lot of people here recently with the long term storytelling just be like, "Oh, this is like, this is masterful. This is cinema." You know that that meme that goes around a lot. And yes, it is great, but is it is also like. The Roman moment with Seth, that's just what good storytelling is. That's just, that is what, that's that's Aristotle and poetics. Like, that is, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, like, wrestling now is finally taking a turn to what other art forms have been doing for forever now. It's just that we haven't seen it in wrestling a lot. And so now it is, like, and I think part of it is because so many people our age you know grew up loving other stuff and also loving wrestling and so our other loves and the other influences we have bleed over into our love of wrestling where and we're just exposed to so many more stories now and so much more content whereas like maybe in the 70s and 80s that really wasn't the case so i don't i think it also go ahead uh, i think it also has to do with the fact that Wrestling is a sport, and up until the the last thirty or so years, you had jocks and you had nerds. Yeah. And now you're you're getting nerd jocks who have grew up. I mean, to 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 spotlight that he was in a WrestleMania event. Johnny Gargano was given by his wife an Avengers number one comic book. And so you got these people that are growing up on these comic books that had those those kind of story beats to them. So they're now bringing those mentalities like you were saying in. So it's those nerd jocks that's kind of twisting things up. Yeah, it's, it's making for good uh, good wrestling and good stories. Now, that being said, if this match happened with the regime that was in power, say, a year and a half ago... You don't get that payoff. Oh no. That, well, that's my the last thing I have listed here is let's pretend that Cody didn't come back. Who should have taken the belt off of Roman? Sammy. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, it should have been Sammy. But like that that but that is part of it too. I don't even know if we get the Roman Reigns run without Cody coming back. Like there's been talk here, Wrestle like WrestleMania season of like a new era of WWE. The new era of WWE started when Cody Rhodes came back, WrestleMania 38. That's when the new era of two, WWE yeah, started. Two years ago. And like, you know, we'll have time to kind of do a retrospective of Roman Reigns' career because I think he's he's going to be gone for, I think a while. We might not see him for months. Um. What what's different about that? Well, <laughs> there's there, there, I guess that you know touche there, but I, I do think Cody now having the belt. You know, he talked about on Monday Night Raw Roman being the most important wrestler of his generation. I don't think that's the case. I think he's being humble. Cody Rhodes changed wrestling in America. Um, you do not get the WWE you get now without Cody leaving and doing the independence and starting up AEW 
and having AEW usher in kind of like a new sort of way or, or just an alternative. None of none of the WWE now happens without Cody Rhodes and without the Young Bucks and Omega and Tony Khan. For as much as people like to shit on AEW, and listen, we have our critiques of AEW. They With, they they helped get us to where we are right now. Without that that competition, WWE doesn't step up their game. No, no way. There's no chance in hell because they have no reason to. There's no incentive. And like, because Cody didn't change anything when he came from AEW to WWE. Same music, same attire, same look. Same name. Same name. <laughs> like, he, he, we will look back at this moment in this era of wrestling. And I'm not going to say that we're that in 20 years from now, Cody Rhodes is going to be on the Mount Rushmore of most influential wrestlers of all time. But I don't think he's going to be that far off. <laughs> I, I really don't. Uh, and so to have him be in this moment, as unlikely as it seemed five years ago, because he could have easily stayed in WWE and been a forever mid Carter like Dolph Ziggler. But he took a chance yeah. on himself. And now he yeah. is by far the biggest baby face in wrestling. It's a it's wild to think about. It's uh, truly the crazy. Quote is, quote is what from undesirable to undeniable to undisputed. Undeniable. Yeah. I, I I'm not gonna lie. lie. I, I did laugh my, at myself thinking about how if he didn't win this match, he had booked himself into not once but twice never competing for a for the for the world title. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this that is going to be a great sliding doors what if. What if Cody Rhodes never left WWE in the first place? And what if he never left AEW? What yeah. if Tony Khan convinced him to turn heel in AEW and stay there? What would WWE look like and what would AEW look like? It'll be It's going to be great to kind of think about and play around with. So, wrapping up Mania, this was in a little vignette after the show I think or maybe it was in the middle of the show there was a thing about Nia Jax I didn't realize she was the Rock's cousin this explains a lot to me <laughs> uh, why she gets the time that she does because she's not I just don't whatever we don't have to talk about it I just was like okay now I know she's the Rock's cousin that's why she gets to be on TV um that's why they brought her back. Well, so is Tamina, but she isn't getting that time. Yeah. Oh, well. My disdain for Nia Jax. I just thought I needed to throw <laughs> that in there. Uh, all right. So Monday Night Raw. Cody uh, with a 47-minute intro and speech, right? Yep. With The Rock in there. What did The Rock give him? Or what are we supposed to think The Rock gave him? He gave him the bead, one of the beads from Roman's necklace. That's what he was talking. That's what he's referring to, where he, I th where he said, "You don't have to open your hand to know what that is," and that's where you get the "Don't ever break my heart again," because I think they're going to play on the fact that that the the Rock is consumed by Cody Rhodes now because Cody now occupies the same space that The Rock once did and he did it by toppling his family to get there. I like that story. Yeah. I figured it was the lighter from the, a, a cigarette lighter from where he set his bus on fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I you, thought it was did pretty... Did you text that to oh, us? Did you, yeah. Oh, I don't know who did. Did you text that to yes. us? What I just... Oh, yes, okay. Steven, yeah. But uh, fans, fans online were kind of like, "What? Is, what's in the hand?" And I was like, "How? Oh, is it not kind of obvious what he kind of?" And I might be wrong. It, it, it wasn't. But I, 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 I did not even think about that. Yeah, that's that's where I would go with that. Interesting. But I, I do. You got any more thoughts? I do like the because people thought the the promo was awkward between them. It was a little long. I'll give you that. It was very long. Yeah. I like the. I think it was awkward, obviously, on purpose. It reminded me a little bit of like the um, the James Bond scene in Skyfall where Javier Bardem has Daniel Craig tied up to the chair and it's like sort of pseudo-sexual. He's kind of making passes at him. Because I think now we get the... We, we, we had the Rock final boss yelling at the rafters making middle school jokes. Now I think we're going to get the sinister final boss 
were now because because the rock and kayfabe never expected cody to win right but now cody's sure. a real threat so now we have to we we got to turn the dial a little bit and we have we got to take him out so i think that's why he was like a little bit more coy last night and just the awkward like let me hold the title i i, I loved it i thought i thought it was great i didn't i didn't get i didn't understand all the hate for it I, 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 it was a, to me it was a little long to trim about 10 minutes off that but at the same time I get why they let it go as much as they, they did with him pausing to let the crowd boo to kind of build the the sense of what was going on so I, I didn't hate that part of it um, the the title exchange it, it was kind of awkward but I think it, it was designed to be that way too so I agree with you on that but you know this, to me, the the Raw itself was a, a a good way to do a season premiere of of Monday Night Raw in WWE. I fast forwarded a lot of the night. Um, I did watch a couple of things here and there. That you know, we saw the Judgment Day versus our Truth and a a guy they can't see, which y'all knew where that was going, right? Yep. I enjoyed that. Uh, I enjoyed that that intro of of them all raising their titles, and suddenly you see our truth just pop up and being like, "I got to I brought the titles back to Judgment Day." That's funny. I mean, is Patrick had the point earlier though about like, "Oh, hey, here we go, right into the comedy thing again." But um, so I'm gonna laugh at it either way. I don't. I mean, I'm gonna laugh at our truth. Uh, so we get the quick appearance from Cena. You, you fast forwarded uh, through some of the matches then, because I mean, you, you the first match right out of the gate was uh, Ilja and, and Shinsuke Nakamura. So you get introduced to potentially the next up and coming guy who is a hard hitter, who is going to be somebody who is going to be on the level of Gunther, because he is on the level of Gunther already. Yeah, but I didn't get to start it till eight o'clock, yeah. and I didn't. I knew I wasn't going to be awake at eleven o'clock if I didn't fast fast forward through some matches. He, uh, uh, Dragonoff can uh, he can do that little fist from the top rope thing now. He ain't going to be doing that in three months. He's going to mess it up. It's going to go sideways on somebody. And it's going to be like, hey, that's cool. You can break it out every once in a while, but that's not going to be a thing you do going forward. The little stiff just fall down on somebody. Yeah. <laughs> You, you, that that goes south on Randy Orton one time, and that's going to be the last time you oh. ever do do anything like that. <laughs> we didn't talk about the brain buster that Sammy gave. Oh well, that's uh, yeah, the super finisher. That's it was fantastic. Break, you know, like you said, break it out, everyone. Break it out, yeah. Right. Um. So let's see. Uh, Jay Uso pins Drew in the Fatal Four Way after some interference from CM Punk. Um. What do y'all think about them? There is that. There's is that just their way of delaying because Punk still isn't healthy because they want to get Drew and Punk in a in a thing ASAP when he's healthy, right? So they were like, "Screw it, let's let Jay win." I think the, you, you got to pull the trigger on Jake earlier than later because the longer you let him linger there, he, he'll fade fast. Yeah. Whereas Drew, whereas Drew can maintain himself, as you've seen from the the ability to to shit talk anybody and everybody, whether it's you know CM Punk or Bondage Undertaker. <laughs> CM Punk, bro, you you just, you a hater now. Come on now, leave us leave our man Drew alone. Drew ain't done nothing to you but talk trash on the internet. This is now twice you've cost this man a title. He ain't never done nothing. He, he he wasn't trying to actually hurt your tricep. He just prayed to God that it would happen, and it happened. Okay? It's a little bit different. Now you just out here hating. You hiding under the rings and shit? Come on. Yeah. I thought that was funny because it was very not CM Punk-like. And then all of a sudden his, jump, his ass jumps out from under that ring. Caught me off guard. Um... Y'all got any other thoughts on on Raw from last night? I know we've got a couple of off-topic things down like, here. Like I said, th- th- this was a good intro to, as a season premiere. It gave you, it establishes what we're kind of expecting, kind of sets up where I assume Rock and Cody are are mania for next year. Maybe you kind of see the up and coming people that are your a couple NXT people. You get the the that mid card kind of feel of what's going to be coming too. So I thought this was a good introduction to people. You're going to need some people to step up though. If if Seth is going to take some time, Roman's going to take some time, Becky's going to take some time. This is where the op- this is where you look at some other people and be like, well, you know, I, okay, Dragon off. What what do you really got? Is it going to translate to a big stage? 
Um, you know, same with Roxanne Perez. If she gets called up, like you got a Liv Morgan, obviously getting involved with Rhea, like these, which that chair shot was. <laughs> search, chair shot. I was like, damn. Yeah. I had to rewind to watch that again. I was like, yeah, it hits a shit out of her. Uh, but so but you need to, you know now the the spotlight can get shared a little bit. So who's going to step up and step up into it? So we'll see. Someone someone out there on on the Twitterverse put a meme of it of where that chair shot it hits her in the head and the sonic rings pop out. It was beautiful. <laughs> As Patrick has said on numerous occasions, the internet is undefeated. <laughs> Stays undefeated. All right, so uh, other notes here. The first rule of rankings is we don't talk about rankings. Uh, you, you've said I'm not allowed to talk about this, but these rankings things are driving me crazy. So are we in AEW territory We, we are, now, Amanda, because here's what y- – y'all didn't watch Collision, but they said – they had an interview backstage where I, I want to say it was Garcia talking about how – he's like, I know I just can't come in here. We've got the ranking systems. I can't come in and just you know declare I'm going to be on a championship match. And yet one, one Wednesday ago, you had somebody come in with zero wins, zero losses, and say, I got next on a title. And that would be Mercedes Monet. You've got Swerve as number one. You got Orange Cassidy as number two. You got Will Asprey as number three. Will has wrestled four matches. Daniel Bryan's got ten under his belt, and it's the, Will Asprey is somewhere down in like number seven or eight. If you do, are doing these rankings anywhere legitimate, this goes back to get some consistency with it. Half of them are showing all their wins for for the year, all their wins for their lifetime. Some don't even show wins. Show a consistency. The, that's all I want. No, I mean, I'm I'm done with the. I'm not the rankings don't exist to me. I was just gonna keep looking at y'all until one of y'all said something. In else. my cafe brain, the I have the rankings have been displaced. So it's like it's like the the uh, what was it the peanut whenever uh or Charlie Brown whenever the grown ups talked it was just warm warm warm. Whenever I hear rankings warm. in AEW, that's all I hear. It goes in my and, brain, and that's yeah. fine. I I don't care if you would if you would take those things out and st- you can don't show me the wins losses. If somebody wants to be nerd and dive into them and, and dispute them, that's fine. But the moment that you are putting them on the TV, <laughs> it puts it in my face what that that you they the, the collision thing that it's like. They had a match between FTR and Top Flight for the the finals of what's happening on Wednesday. And they point out in the middle of FTR is using those tag team ropes. No one else does. Well, that's the rules, Tony. They should be doing them. Well, no one else does. So if you're pointing out that nobody gives a shit about the rules in your thing, why do anybody break a hold when they grab a, a rope? Why does anybody care about the, the, the five or ten counts or anything? You, you've you established your rules don't matter a goddamn thing. I This is this section of the podcast is sponsored by Stephen's Heart Rate and Blood Pressure Medicine. Oh. I don't disagree. Look I don't how- disagree. No, he's angry. I don't disagree, but I've accepted. I've accepted to love AEW despite its flaws. Because, like I said, I think when it 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 hits, it hits all the right nerves for me. I can't help but not love it. But I understand what every every, every critique everybody has about AEW. I understand wholeheartedly. But it's like a child. I love it in spite of its all its flaws. All right, so uh, WWE Speed, you wanted to talk about this just a little bit, right? So this is the, 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 the drastic difference between the two programs of AEW and WWE. AEW gave like 15 minutes to House of Black versus um, Christopher Daniels, Matt Seidel, and Keith, uh, not Keith Lee, but the, the, the Bounty Hunter one. What's, what's his name? Brian, Brian Keith. Brian Keith, thank you. Gave them 15 minutes, which should have been at max a four to five minute match. Meanwhile, on the opposite end, you've got WWE has now introduced the WWE speed belt where they are competing to win in three minutes or less. And I think these are two extremes of one going too far with how long matches are that don't need to be overly long and one going too short with trying to race through something that needs a little more room to breathe. And I think there's a perfect kind of spot there that that they both could get back down to that would make match length just where it needed to be. And every match is going to be different. I get that some matches are going to need those 30 minutes, but I, I think some go too long and WWE is on the opposite end of, of trying to plow through as much as they can as fast as they can 
and maybe in three minutes is a stupid I, is a stupid concept. Okay. Well, at least we'll agree on that. <laughs> I'm not watching any speed matches. It's it's it can exist. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, so NXT stand and deliver. The only match I did watch was Trick versus Mello, and this one underperformed for me. I, I I wanted a lot out of it. I think based on the hype around these two guys and what I've seen, very little I've seen out of both of them. But there was too much too too much standing around waiting on a spot to happen. Yep. Um, just felt weird and uncomfortable in a couple of places. As I told Patrick before we started recording, I think this one needed a stipulation to give it some some energy and a direction to kind of focus. Maybe so. Yeah. I think this is a good learning experience for both guys. What you learned about Trick is that he's not ready, which is fine. He's still young. He's got everything else, but he's not ready. And I think for Carmelo, this is a good learning experience particularly because he's essentially the protege of Shawn Michaels. Carmelo, if you're going to be a top guy, you got to learn how to carry some of these dudes to big-time moments. Shawn Michaels did this throughout his entire career. How many times was he across the ring from somebody that had no business being in the ring with him, had nowhere near the level of talent, and he got a great match out of him? Same with Ric Flair. Ric Flair's whole career is based on going to towns where dudes did not deserve to be in a ring with him and going 60 minutes in front of a sold-out house. Carmelo, if he's going to be a top guy, he's got to learn how to do that. So this is a good learning experience for both of these guys, and they'll both be better because of it. It's just unfortunate because they were the main event, WrestleMania weekend. You would have hoped that this would be the moment where it comes together for him, and it didn't. But that's not to say that both of these, either one of these dudes are scrubs because I both think they're, right, they're right, big time right. main event level talent. No, this this was a B match, not an A match. It wasn't a C, but it, it, it didn't excel to where it needed to be. And we have to, we got to re- keep in mind NXT is developmental for a reason. They're right. learning. But on that note, if you do go back and watch any of it, the North American title and the tag teams are the two to watch off that one. Those are the ones that overperformed. So this next note, um, I have fast-forwarded through the Bronson Reed backstage interview, but I did see people tweeting about what seemed to be glitches in the thing, and then there was a weird... Have you seen the weird music that played Yeah. in one of the commercial breaks? Yeah. So they're teasing uh, maybe an Uncle Howdy return? Or Did you... Did, have have you both watched that Bray documentary yet? I didn't get... A, I watched it last week. I didn't get a chance yeah. to... So, if you don't care me about spoiling it, at the end, they kind of give you a preview of what's coming, and I think this is what's coming. So, is it Bo Dallas? I think so. Yeah, there there was, like, after the credits and everything on the documentary, um, you see a lantern, and then you hear a voice go, run! And then Uncle Howdy pops up behind the lantern. Right. Uh... Okay. No. <laughs> I'm not trying to be disrespectful, does, but like Bray was a one on one. But but see that's does does, that's the, that's, does Uncle Howdy work without the fiend? We're gonna have to see this. That that's and that's the takeaway of this. The the Bray documentary itself I was kind of disappointed in. I, I'm a huge I was a huge Bray fan. So t- to to kind of the way that documentary played out, it made me feel like while he was one of one he wasn't the one coming up with the ideas. He was just he, he may have had the what if scenarios, but somebody he was he was the James Patterson of of his ideas in the sense of he had the the rough sketch, but other people were, were doing the heavy lifting for him. And I think that what Bo might bring is some of those things that were still left in there because they were both looking forward to being the monsters together. This was like, you know Sure. And I'm I'm not opposed to the idea. I just don't know that the Uncle Howdy character works without the Fiend. Maybe he could be some other weird incarnation of something, you know, that would be in the Wyatt family, but I I don't know. Yeah, I mean, let's let's not forget that we all left off thinking about the Uncle Howdy character, that it was kind of (laughs) stupid. You know, the mask was kind of dumb. Everything about it was kind of dumb. Now they might change some stuff, and who knows? But um, yeah, yeah, it it definitely is cool when they do the Easter egg things. It adds another element of storytelling. But yeah, I'll yeah. I'll hold off judgment till I see some stuff. Yeah, um, 
that's kind of what I'm hoping. Maybe it'll be some new take on it or whatever. Uh, we'll see. Um, and then lastly, Collision. Not Collision. We I didn't watch Collision, so... And I don't think you did either, Patrick? No, I didn't watch Collision. And, Stephen, you said there wasn't anything worth discussing. No, nah, not really. Um, but we matches. do... Yeah. The, we, since we covered uh, Dynamite last week when we recorded late on Thursday, uh, the, <laughs> I guess two things. One is the Dustin Rhodes. What did you... Okay, so Dustin Rhodes doesn't have... Uh, a thing like there's no reason for him to be competing but he said that in his promo he was like you have no obligation to face me and then he challenges Samoa Joe right so someone pointed out on Twitter that it was finish the story a Rhodes versus a man named Joe right because Roman's real name is Joe um I hadn't made that connection yet but it's it this is AEW's version of finish the story I mean Dustin cut the exact same promo. Well, I say that. Dustin cut a promo that was the the worst hits of the Cody Rhodes story. He just got all the same story beats about this, and it's um this when tomorrow is is has me worked up a little bit. We've got the story about how we're going to have the the CCTV footage, right? So they are, which I thought was a joke at first. They so in theory, this is them trying to draw their biggest attention to the to the company in a long time, right? Because they're capitalizing on on all the hype of CM Punk. And in order to get people to stay for your, their show the next week, they have Dustin Rhodes versus Joe. They have Mariah May versus Anna Jade. You have Lion Hook and Sabata uh, um, versus Shane Taylor Promotions and Anthony Ogogo. You've got Edge versus Penta, which is your best match on that card. The, you have the you're going to have the world's attention on you, and that's your payoff to get me to stay. And, and that's disappointing. It's like they 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 don't know how to capitalize on attention that they're going to get. I mean, I'm not going to argue that, but a couple of these matches were announced before they announced that they were going to show that footage. So it'd be, kind of be a slap in the face to be like, hey, we got to change this up. You're not good enough to be in this show. Oh, it's not a slap right? in the face. You, you flat out tell them you're not a main card event. I'm sorry. And the quicker somebody learns to realize that, the quicker that they can progress in AEW because right now you're continuing to give matches on collision. We got Claudio Castanelli for 11 minutes, 11 plus minutes versus The Butcher. I like The Butcher. He ain't an 11 minute versus Claudio uh, Claudio match. You got um, the magical girl versus the one girl who's in the infantry that went, you know, for like a decent amount of time you continue to have these people that are not your stars in the company that you are giving so much of your valuable time to while letting other people not jay white was nowhere on anywhere on tv swerve was nowhere on tv you had a promo for joe responding to dustin rhodes Dustin Rhodes is a 55-year-old man who's not going to do anything. It's great that he's got a job. I love him to death, but he's not the future of your company. You've got Chris Jericho, who is perpetually pushing th- this, this... He had a match with Hook against Shane Taylor promotion that involved a go-go coming in and jumping them after the match where I'm going, I didn't even remember who the hell the dude is, and he killed an entire Cody career in AEW. I mean, you're not wrong in a lot of your points, but like, who are some of the, like, why was some of the shit on the Monday after Raw last night? Like, the biggest Raw of the year, and like, most the stuff we talked about was on Raw was like promo related uh, mostly, except uh, for the Fatal Four. Okay, Four-way. you had your big, you had The Rock and Cody Rhodes, your two biggest stars. They, they took 45 minutes of your TV show. You, you had, introduction to two NXT stars that are potentially your next ones to be drafted up, which also gets you attention on them, but also on the brand itself, so it's directing you to another TV show. Yeah, but a casual watcher is going to be like, why? who is there with these people? But, they, but that again, it, it's a commercial for them. 
So that that's why they're there. You get the Judgment Day, which sets the scene of your two new your your new champion and a continue of your Rhea Ripley while also establishing your 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 tag title champions. And then you get the the Rhea Ripley spot with Liv Morgan, which sets up that title. And then you get the next the four way to get to your challenger for Damian. Those all make sense in the in the aspect of it. Having Joe versus that would essentially be in like having um, Akira Tozawa as the first opponent for for Damian Priest. I will hold off all my AEW talk for next week till I see what this footage is going to be. I liked so WrestleMania. The, the, I want to. I'm not you know, AEW. Like I said, for all its flaws, it's still my child. But uh, we might. There might be some tough love that needs to come down next week, based off what happens. Sure. If it but pays off, the, I'm happy. I'll, I'll, I will. I will gladly come on here and say I was wrong. The thinking is that Punk got out there, talked a lot of shit, told his side of the story, his side of the story, which people keep saying. And so the thought process between why would they all of a sudden decide they want to air this footage is that it's going to show Punk in a really negative light, right? That's the only reason why it would make any sense is that it proves that everything Punk's been out here talking about is wrong. Because anything less than that, and you look kind of stupid for doing it, and you look kind of immature. But if it shows that Punk's a lying asshole, then it's kind of a ballsy move. By Tony, well, right? Well, let's keep in mind it's being narrated by the Bucks, so it's going to be a propaganda video to get them into Jack Perry. There's going to it's it's while we may see some footage, it's going to be the footage that they want you to see. Sure, and you know it it's like I said, if if it shows Punk throwing wild punches and sucking at a chokehold, that's not news to me. I, I remember his UFC days. It, it, it's it's not like we're, we're a stranger to to Punk not being good at real fights. What it should do is it should further the story between the Young Bucks and FTR. And what it should do is have the Bucks cut a promo on FTR being like, you are still, you are Phil's boys. You're the cancer that's in this locker room that needs to go. And FTR needs to cut it and say, no, AEW is being held back because of your the two of your guys' egos. And at Dynasty, we're going to beat your ass and take the, you know, blah, 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 cut into a babyface promo. That's what it should do. Now, whether anybody's got enough sense to do that and do business with that is remains Make to be work. seen. But that's what it but should it, do. But at this point, if that's what they do with it and they don't show a whole bunch of exciting, if if the CCTV footage that they show is not exciting, you've dug your own grave with us. Oh, I think it's going to yeah. be pretty wild. That's me personally. I don't, yeah, I mean... I, I yeah I, I don't think they take it this big of a chance if it's not some crazy shit happening. But you know we'll see. We'll find we'll find out tonight. Yeah, if you're listening on release day, we'll find out tonight. That's uh it's been a super size episode because I, we we covered mania and more. Um, do you guys have any other final thoughts before we we check out of here? No. Nope. <laughs> y'all y'all worn out from Wrestlemania it sounds like I'm, I'm good yeah it was a lot pro wrestling <laughs> is co- pro wrestling is cool pro wrestling is back so that's good yeah back huh I kept hearing that and I was like where's it been well in WWE it's been sports entertainment so this yeah. is this true. pro wrestling true 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 alright gotcha alright well I think that'll do it for us uh, y'all be sure to follow us on Instagram uh, and threads and occasionally on X at, Al- at Alabama Slam Pod and you can follow our network of podcasters at the alabamatake.com and on all social media outlets and uh, we'll talk to y'all next week. Thanks. Thanks.